The Lord be with you. And also with you. Good morning and welcome everyone to our online service here in Hillsborough Presbyterian Church. A few announcements to make at the beginning. Uh, eventually we hope when we procure the equipment that gets set up to have live streaming of these services so that you can both attend church here or have it live at home or watch it afterwards. But until that happens, we will continue with these pre-recorded online services. So please continue to join in and we're glad to have your company. Secondly, for each succeeding week, that will be next Sunday, the 13th of September, we need you to contact Dawn again to indicate your intention to attend so that we can facilitate the intended number. So please contact Dawn, the details given on the screen, by next Friday at noon. And a third announcement, whilst we would like to begin our youth and children's activities as soon as possible, at the moment that's not, that isn't quite possible, but we are looking for details for GDPR reasons, uh, child care policy obviously, just to be able to refresh and update the details that we have on that so that we can keep in contact and inform you of what is happening and when. So please go to the church's homepage on the website and go to the orange button and follow from there and we can keep in touch by that means. Thank you. Our call to worship is taken from Psalm 42. As a deer longs for a stream of cool water, so I long for you, O God. I thirst for the living God. When can I go and worship in your presence? Why am I so sad? Why am I so troubled? I will put my hope in God. And once again, I will praise him, my saviour and my God. Let us render those words from the psalmist into song, hymn number 488, As the deer pants for the water. Living God, our heart's desire, our longing to worship you is often stifled by heavy demands or light distractions. But here and now we worship and adore you. As the deer pants for water, as migrating birds make for warmer climes, as the bee is drawn to the vivid colours of bright flowers, so the power of your spirit brings us back to you. 
the living God. As with the morning dew, we are refreshed and renewed by the nearness of your elusive presence. And as with the pollen on summer flowers, something of your glory rubs off on us too, entering once more the wonders of your new creation. We are glad to call your Son, Jesus Christ, our friend and brother. For in his incarnate life, Jesus called ordinary people like us, befriending them despite their faults and sins, their weakness and failings. And now in risen form, Christ comes to meet us on our daily journey, pioneering a path when we are stuck presenting new possibilities beyond the confines of our small minds or sterile habits. Remind us, O God, that only you can fully and finally satisfy. Remind us that much of what we want in life turns out to be empty or vain, shallow or hollow, that real joy and lasting treasure are immeasurably more in store for us when we are in communion with you, the eternal and enriching God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We say together the words of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Good morning, boys and girls. Today, Michael Thompson will speak to you. Good morning and welcome to this week's Children's Address. Now, we're going to follow on from what Holly was talking about last week, which is the idea of the armour of God. Now, I know you guys probably got stuck at hearing about superheroes, so we're going to move on to a different type of hero. Whenever you think of armour, what is the first thing that comes into your head? For me, it's knights. Knights of the old guard, guys in big massive metal suits, walking about the place, looking really cool, and looking a wee bit scary. But these knights were always, always prepared for battle. And that's what God is trying to do for us. He is trying to prepare us for battle against evil. He is trying to prepare us spiritually by giving us all this equipment. So last week, Holly spoke about the belt of truth and the breastplate of righteousness. So we're going to make our way down the body, all the way down to our feet. And today, I'm going to talk about the shoes of the gospel of peace. I am sure you're probably wondering, well, we know what shoes are, but I'm not too confident on what the gospel of peace is. Well, the gospel of peace is that Jesus came and died on the cross for our sins and then rose from the dead and ascended into heaven. This means that if we believe in Jesus and ask him to forgive us for our sins, then we can live a peaceful life without worry. We don't. We don't have to worry because we know that we're going to heaven. Why do you think we have to repair our feet for this? Our job as warriors for God is to let as many people know about the gospel as possible. One way in which we can do this is to tell them about the ABCs of salvation. So what are the ABCs of salvation? Well, A means that you accept that you're a sinner. We all do bad things and somebody needs to help us with these sins. B means you believe that Jesus has already died for all of our sins and wants us to follow him and someday go to heaven. And finally C. C means to confess your sins to Jesus and ask him to come into your heart and forgive you for all that you have done wrong. If you haven't already done this in your own life, then how can you show other people how to do it? If we say we love Jesus, we need to act like it. We need to walk the walk or talk the talk, as someone says. Imagine this. We're playing basketball and there's a big massive hoop that's nine foot or ten feet up on the ground. I, I'm not really that good at basketball, but I know it's a lot taller than me. And I said to you, I can slam dunk that. Now we play basketball for a few hours and you never see me slam dunk it once. Are you going to believe me that I can do it? Now, this is just an example. I can't really slam dunk it, okay? I'm very small. But 
If I showed you that I could slam dunk it, you would believe me. You would know what I was doing. You would trust me. You wouldn't believe me if I didn't prove it. Being a Christian is kind of the same. When we say we love Jesus, but then we don't act like it, we are not walking the walk. The shoes of God, or the shoes of the gospel of peace, help us to remember to follow Jesus. When we are following Jesus and doing what he wants us to do, we stay away from evil and not give in to what bad people want us to do. It's important to put on the shoes of the gospel of peace every day to keep ourselves from following evil. You're probably wondering, well, how do we put on these, these shoes of the gospel of peace? Ephesians 6, 15 says that we put on the readiness that comes with the gospel of peace. This means we have to be ready to tell other people about Jesus. So we're going to look back at this knight's armour, okay? They wear a lot of armour. And it's, they are covered head to toe in metal. And you're thinking, ain't no way I'm going to take that knight down. I'm not. If I saw a knight in the street, I'd run. I know I'm not going to have that chance against him. But in all that armour, there is still some weakness. And that's why they carry a shield. No matter how well protected a knight is, there's always going to be a weakness somewhere. All the enemy has to do is find where that weakness is and take advantage. The most famous example in the world is Achilles. Achilles had a soft spot on the heel, took an hour to the heel and that was him knocked down. This Mr. Invincible had one soft spot. There's always one certain part of, certain part of the body. The shield though, in an arm, in a, the shield in a knight's armour can move to protect where he is weakest. It keeps him from arrows from piercing those one areas that everyone knows. Great warriors know how to protect themselves from danger. And this is what God has given us. God uses a shield to represent faith. Faith covers areas of our lives where we struggle with sins, where we don't know the answer to a question. Hebrews 11 tells us of people in the Old Testament who had faith to get through really, really difficult situations. Like when Abraham and Sarah trusted that God would provide them with a child. Then when God fulfilled his promise, he actually said to Abraham to sacrifice his son Isaac. Now, Sounds like a pretty rubbish deal, doesn't it? It's like me telling you, I'm going to go buy you a bag of sweets. And then whenever I give you them, I'm like, actually, I want them back. But you wouldn't feel too good about it. Now think about how you'd feel if you got something you really wanted from God, and then you were told to give it back and you couldn't have it anymore. That's exactly what happened to them. But Abraham knew that God wouldn't break his promise. He trusted God in all that he did, even though the situation seemed bleak. Seemed awful, seemed up against the fence, he still trusted God would, would come through. That's because God is always faithful. The shield of faith is not only the faithfulness that we use to trust God that will protect us in our war against Satan. The problem is when we doubt these things, we're not being faithful. That's why God is faithful to us. He will never leave us. Even when we sin and doubt God, he's still there to protect us. When we believe that, Trust God is there for us in all situations. We are picking up our shield of faith. Our second praise is led by Alice Francie and it's entitled, Your Name is Power.
Our scripture today is taken from the New Testament Gospels. It's Luke chapter 9, reading verses 1 to 6, and our reader is Derek McClellan. Jesus sends out the twelve disciples. Jesus called the twelve disciples together and gave them power and authority to drive out all demons and to cure diseases. Then he sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. After saying to them, Take nothing with you for the journey, no stick, no baggers bag, no food, no money, not even an extra shirt. Wherever you are welcome, stay in the same house until you leave that town. Wherever people don't welcome you, leave that town and shake the dust off your feet as a warning to them. Disciples left and travelled through all the villages, preaching the good news and healing people everywhere. Our third praise is 108, O God of Bethel, by whose hand? In the last week or two, our children, our young people have returned to school, familiar places or maybe new places for them. There's all that change and anticipation that comes with September and the return to such places. Some people are excited about the new, a new class, a new teacher, maybe new classmates, maybe even a new school. Others though are a bit apprehensive and concerned, maybe to the point of being frightened or fearful. And of course, those different mixed feelings have been exacerbated by the coronavirus and all that that has meant in, in the last six months or so. I well know the feeling of what it's like to anticipate the new when you're going to school because with my father having been in the forces and moving from church to church, I was in quite a few different primary schools, Scotland, England, various places in Northern Ireland. And eventually when we did settle in P5 Strand Town, I was just glad to put down some roots and have friends for, for longer than I had in the past. So I know the feeling of not quite fitting in, of not knowing people, feeling strange and maybe feeling that you don't belong. Some people make you feel welcome, other people brush you off. I know something of that feeling. And yet that's child's play to those who have no choice. Those people whose lives and livelihoods, their way of life, um, 
there's security and stability and all of that serenity is just is, is totally overwhelmed by perhaps a civil war in Syria or all those other things that make life so miserable so that people have to leave home, go on the road and become refugees, bouncing from place to place, often not very welcome. They feel they don't belong and they're told they don't belong. You're not one of us. That unsettling of being a refugee and on the move and being uncertain and vulnerable is written into the lines of the biblical narrative time after time after time. Right in the beginning, Adam and Eve have everything that they could wish for in Eden and paradise. And yet through their own choices, God banishes them. They are sent out, no longer in the place they belong. Now they find themselves, in a sense, as scattered refugees. Abram and Sarah are settled with a life of shalom and prosperity, perfectly happy in Ur of the Chaldees round Mesopotamia. But Abraham is called by God and strikes out on a path to be the father figure, literally the father of the new people Israel, born through Sarah, his old and seemingly barren wife. And they will be the progenitors of a new people, more numerous than the stars in the sky and the grains of sand on the seashore. They were on the move perennially. They were almost like refugees or, or migrants just traveling and they didn't know where. Israel found itself prospering under Joseph, but as a new Pharaoh came and the, the decades passed, there was another Pharaoh who came to the throne who saw them as a threat. We remember the story of Joseph from a few weeks back. And so Moses is, is told to go to Pharaoh, this tyrant king, and say to them, let my people go. Let them be pilgrims who travel through the desert, the wilderness, until they reach the promised land. And centuries later, when Israel is prospering in the promised land in Jerusalem, they're overrun by the Babylonians, taken into exile. Again, they find themselves scattered refugees, vulnerable. And that sense of heartache and of longing to go back to the place they belong haunts their songs. Remember Psalm 137? By the rivers of Babylon we sat down and wept. Our captors tormented us, they mocked us. So how can we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? That laments, that dislocation. They were refugees always on the move. And that's the case for Jesus right from the beginning of his story as a tiny baby with Herod's genocidal policy. As he imbibed his mother's milk and didn't understand what was happening, his mum, his dad and himself had to flee as refugees. Where to? Back to the old slavery haunt of Egypt. Isn't that ironic? And yet God's plans in store are that they move back to Nazareth when things are safer he grows up as an apprentice to his dad, as a carpenter and a builder. And then in adulthood, he discerns the call of God upon him. This time, his heavenly father. He calls him to be not just the suffering servant of Isaiah, who serves the Lord, but discerns his true identity as the son of the eternal God. And as he prays to God the Father and is given the gift of the Spirit, so he begins his messianic ministry. A mission not just to Israel, but to those further afield as well. In today's story from Luke chapter 9, we see how this local rabbi Jesus is now becoming the redeemer of others. Indeed, he will be uh, acknowledged as the Lord of creation later on when the New Testament is being formed. But for now in the Gospels, in Matthew, Mark and Luke, and particularly to at Luke chapter 9 today, this text reveals Jesus is modus operandi. He himself is an itinerant, always on the move. A preacher, a teacher, a healer. Someone who throws himself upon the hospitality of others because he trusts in the mercy of God to provide. And as he selects and trains up and equips and sends out his 12 disciples who will follow that way of life as itinerants, he gives them this instruction. Take nothing with you on the journey. That's the catchphrase. Take nothing with you in the journey. In Mark's gospel, they're allowed to take a stick. But in Matthew and Luke, it's even more radical. There's no bag, no money, no second shirt, no tunic, 
no possessions at all, not even a stick which would have been your one modest means of protecting yourself against bandits. Take nothing with you on the journey. In other words, travel light, sit light to possessions and security and all the things that you take for granted at home when you're settled. Yes, of course, Jesus wants them and us to have a life of shalom, security, peace, well-being, even prosperity. But Jesus tells them when they go and throw themselves upon the hospitality of those who will receive them or who won't, he says, trust in the mercy of God. Preach, teach, proclaim, and drive out the demons and cure people of diseases. But warn those who won't accept you that there is something about life when we cling to possessions, where possessions begin to become things that possess us like demons. And our possessions, our belongings, our security, our status, our position, these become the things that we obsess about and protect And that causes such conflict within ourselves and in our wider society. Those are some of the demons that possess us, our possessions that Jesus wants us to drive out. And so he sends his disciples. First of all, calling them to come and follow me. That's a journey towards him. And then a journey with him or sent by his spirit to go and share and show the good news of Jesus Christ. That possessions should not possess us. And that all the things we obsess about, uh, in a sense, are overcome by the Lordship of God in Jesus Christ. Jesus himself teaches a new creation, a coming kingdom. A way of life that sets aside all these other securities that sometimes begin to trap us and to weigh us down. He says, don't give in to those heavy demands. Sit light, travel light. Take nothing with you for the journey. And Paul, one of the great apostles, who didn't meet Jesus in the flesh, so to speak, but did encounter the risen Christ, carried that same philosophy with him wherever he went. Yes, he settled in certain towns and cities to establish or or to build up churches, but most of the time he was always on the road and on the way. He was a pilgrim, a sojourner, Someone who was journeying with the risen Christ in the power of the Spirit. Indeed, the early Christians were mocked as being people who were called Christians, a kind of offensive term, followers of this Christ, this Jesus, this this no-hoper. But actually, they called themselves initially the people of the way. Jesus being the way, the truth, and the life. Christian tradition has got certain terms for this way of life as we follow Jesus as disciples. It calls us sojourners. It calls us pilgrims who are passing through, never entirely settling down. But two recent Christian writers, Will Willimon and Stanley Herwas, have given us a little uh, term that I think encapsulates this wonderfully well. It's a paraphrase of Paul's writings in Philippians where he says that we are citizens of heaven, but our colony is here on earth for the present. In other words, we are resident aliens. We reside here, yes. We live life as best we can. We enjoy the fruits of of all that God gives on our own labors. But we don't entirely settle down because we don't entirely belong here. We're only passing through. As Hebrew says, we have no enduring city here, Our enduring city is in the heavens that God provides that house of many mansions come the end. I spoke of endings and here I'll end my reflection by saying that if we're on a journey, there's obviously some destination, some homeland that we're making for. And in my pastoral ministry over the years, when I've been with people who have been bereaved or bereaving, or people themselves who realise that their own end is coming soon, they're full of questions, as we all are. Am I good enough? Will I be forgiven? Does God love me? Does God forgive me? What will my destination be and what will it be like? All those questions about who am I, my identity, my destiny, where am I going, where do I belong? The Christian hope, the Christian good news, the Christian gospel is that we belong In a house of many mansions, Jesus having paved the way as pioneer. 
And our role as children of God, as forgiven sinners, as people who accompany Jesus Christ, the risen Christ, the living Lord, walking and keeping in step with the Spirit, is that we shall inhabit that our destiny and our eternal home. By all means, enjoy the journey here and now. But remember that the best is yet to come in our eternal home. All this and heaven too could be the motto of the Christian life, the Christian journey, the Christian way. We are resident aliens in a sometimes strange land. Amen. Let us pray. Living and eternal God, our companion on the journey, yet still somehow the infinite one in whom we live and move and have our being, we are grateful for your perennial presence in our daily lives. You, O oh God, have placed us in specific settings, our own local patch, in which to receive your blessings, to know your love, to share your joy, to rest in your peace. You enhance our lives with family, friend, colleague and companion, these networks of sustenance, our potential realised in the give and take of appreciation and affirmation. For this we give you thanks. But above all, you enrich us with the grace of your Son and the working of your Spirit. And thus we are incorporated into the body of Christ the Church. Yet though we inhabit this world, a wonderful creation from which we draw such benefit, we also know that this is not our lasting home, that we belong most truly and fully in your new creation, that we are pilgrims passing through, resident aliens making our way to the promised land. So as we journey on, O oh God, may your hand, invisible but invincible, guard and guide us, shepherd and sustain us, placing our hope in you even as we venture forth in trust. Dear Lord, keep us safe as we now return to places and practices that we had left aside in the face of the pandemic. Inspire our leaders to promote policies in which partisan politics will yield to the service of the greater good for all. Enable, O oh God, those who tackle our crises from their own distinct perspective to pursue their task, to fulfil their vocation with a tenacity and a transparency that is born of your Spirit. And be especially close to those who are ill or anxious, close to breaking point or even close to death. May your presence be their peace in whatever dark valley they have to endure at the present. the doxology. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Our final praise is 104, Guide me, O my great Redeemer.
Our collect prayer, please join me the words on the screen. God, our eternal home, as we journey through life, let us keep in step with the Spirit, so that as resident aliens, pilgrims passing through, we may follow Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. Amen. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen.